Hi guys! Welcome to another episode of Attorney Ninja Vlogger, Law for the Everyday Layman. Today we continue with our discussion on corporation law under the revised corporation code. And specifically, we'll talk about close corporations today. Close, spelled as C-L-O-S-E, close corporations. Now, if you like my videos and you want to see more, please hit the subscribe button. Also, please remember that this is only for educational purposes and is not a substitute for proper legal advice or for studying and understanding the law. Now, a like on this video or any of my other videos would also be greatly appreciated. Now, let's begin. What's a closed corporation? A closed corporation is simply a corporation in which the stock is held in a few hands or in a few families and which stock is either not at all or only rarely dealt with in buying or in selling. Okay? So it stays only in that group of people. Alright? A closed corporation is uh, what has sometimes been referred to as an incorporated partnership. No? It's like a partnership which is incorporated. No? And according to Clara Campos, the existence of closed corporations can be attributed to the desire of intimate groups of business associations to obtain the advantages of a corporation like limited liability arising from the separate juridical personality i talked about that in my first episode okay however the identity and personality of each stockholder is important to the to his associates so although they may consider their business as a corporation in their dealings with third persons among themselves, no, the members of the corporation, the stockholders act and feel as partners. That's why a closed corporation has been described as a corporation de jure and as a partnership de facto. Okay? They treat each other like partners. A closed corporation then has special needs different from those of a widely held corporation. And in many situations, it would not be fair or practical no, to apply the same principles of law to both kinds of corporations indiscriminately. So just like in non-stock corporations, which I uh, discussed previously, special rules will prevail over general rules. In other words, the provisions of the revised corporation code on closed corporations will primarily govern and the other provisions of the Revised Corporation Code on stock corporations, they will just apply suppletorily, okay? Or in the absence or a lack of provisions in the closed corporation, uh, in the rules on closed corporation, you apply the rules, the, the regular rules on stock corporations, okay? Now, the law says any corporation may be incorporated as a closed corporation except mining oil companies, stock exchanges, banks, insurance companies, public utilities, educational institutions, and corporations declared to be vested with public interest. Okay, those cannot be closed corporations, meaning they cannot be limited to only a few individuals. Okay, now take note also that a corporation shall not be deemed to be a closed corporation when at least two-thirds of its voting stock or voting rights is owned or controlled by another corporation which is not a closed corporation. Okay? Now, to be a closed corporation, the law says that the articles of incorporation must provide for the following matters. First, all the corporations issued stock of all classes exclusive of treasury shares shall be held of record by not more than a specified number of persons not exceeding 20. Okay? So at the max, only 20 members of the or stockholders of the closed corporation. Second, all the issued stock of all classes shall be subject to one or more specified restrictions on transfer permitted by the rules of the closed corporations in the revised corporation code. I'll be talking about the, the restrictions on transfer. But simply put, transfer is restricted. No, you can hindi basta-basta pwedeng i-transfer yung stock kung kanin-kanino lamang. Okay? There are restrictions on transfer. Third, the corporation shall not list in any stock exchange 
or it should not make any public offering of its stocks of any class. Okay, so those are the things that must be in the articles. But aside from those mandatory matters stated in uh, Section 95, Section 96 allows the corporation to include the following matters in the articles. No, It's permissible. They may put it first, a classification of shares or rights, the qualifications for owning or holding the those shares or rights, and restrictions on transfers, okay? Which, uh, I'll talk about this again later, but under Section 97, these are restrictions on the right, the right to transfer shares. And those restrictions must appear in the articles, the bylaws, and the certificate of stock in order to be binding on any purchaser in good faith, okay? I'll talk about this in a bit. Second permissible matter to be included in the articles, no? A classification of directors into one or more classes, each of whom may be voted for and elected solely by a particular class of stock. So like De Leon says, where the article articles provide for, uh, let's say, two classes of stock, the holders of each class would be elected to the board solely by the holders of the same class. And uh, one more item that the law allows to be included in the articles would be for a greater quorum or voting requirement in the meetings of stockholders or directors than those provided for in the revised corporation code. Now still under section 96, the articles of a closed corporation may provide that the business of the corporation will be managed by the stockholders rather than by the board, in which case the stockholders will be deemed to be the directors. And of course, since they're deemed to be directors, they should also be subject to all the liabilities of directors which are imposed by the code. No, When I say code, I'm referring to the revised corporation code. Huh? So, if the articles has this kind of provision that the stockholders uh, will run the corporation instead of the board, and as long as that provision continues in effect, then no meeting of the stockholders need be called to elect directors. Okay? There's no need to call a meeting to elect the directors. It has been said that the outstanding peculiarity of a closed corporation is the identity between stock ownership and active management. Okay? So the stockholders can run the corporation. No? So let's say there are 10 members of the closed corporation or 10 stockholders and one of them is dissatisfied with how the corporation is being run. Can he demand that all 10 members meet to elect directors? Okay, if there is a provision in the articles that the business of the corporation shall be managed by the stockholders, then he cannot do so. He cannot call for a meeting to elect directors. In fact, there is no need for such a meeting because the stockholders, without need of election, act as directors of the corporation by virtue of the provision in the articles. That said, this does not mean that a closed corporation cannot elect directors. No, of course... If they want to have a board of directors, they can elect directors from themselves to run the corporation. Similar to stock corporations, since a closed corporation is an artificial being, it can only act through its board if they are so elected. Now, the law in section 100 says that unless the bylaws provide otherwise, any action taken by the directors of a closed corporation without a meeting called properly and with due notice shall nevertheless be deemed valid if okay so there are three situations no they're not cumulative no either one of them any one of them can be present no so uh, these are the situations first before or after such corporate action is taken a written consent thereto is signed by all the directors, all of them sign. Okay? Second, all the stockholders have actual or implied knowledge of the action and make no prompt objection in writing. Okay? They know, but they don't object in writing. Third, the directors are accustomed to take informal action with the express or implied acquiescence of the stockholders. 
okay? So the, the directors are used to acting even without the consent of the stockholders. And uh, finally, all the directors have expressed or implied knowledge of the action in question and none of them makes prompt objection in writing. So in any of those four instances I mentioned, the action by the directors of a closed corporation will be deemed valid even if there's no meeting. Okay? So take note of those four situations. Now what if the corporate action taken by the directors was arrived at during a meeting without proper call or, or, or notice? And since there was no proper call and notice, one or more of the directors was absent. He was not able to give his consent. Now the law says an action within the corporate powers which is taken at a meeting held without proper call or notice is deemed ratified by a director who failed to attend unless after having knowledge of that action the director promptly files his written objection with the secretary of the corporation. So, if the director does not agree with the corporate action, he has to promptly file a written objection. Huh? And if he does not object, he does not object through that written objection, then he will have he will be deemed to have uh, ratified that corporate action taken when he was absent. Take note also that the law refers to an action within the corporate powers. Huh? Therefore, if the corporate action, th th therefore the corporate action cannot be ratified if it is beyond the powers of the corporation, no? Or an ultra virus act. And again, how do you know if it's outside of the powers? You look at the articles, no? The purpose, the primary and secondary purposes. Okay? You just watch my episode on powers of the corporation. Now, what about officers? The law says that the articles may provide that all officers or employees or that specified officers or employees shall be elected or appointed by the stockholders instead of the board, no? Because usually, officers or employees may be appointed or employed by the board, no? So the articles in a closed corporation can state that the stockholders will be the one to appoint no? the officers or employees, okay? Now let's talk about amendment of the articles. Section 102 says that uh, any amendment to the articles which seeks to delete or remove any provision required by the revised corporation code or to reduce a quorum or voting requirement stated in said articles, no, that will now require an affirmative vote of at least two-thirds of the outstanding capital stock, whether with or without voting rights, or the articles may require a greater proportion than two-thirds, okay, as long as it's written in the articles, no, for amending, deleting, or removing any of the aforesaid prov provisions, no, as long as it is arrived at a meeting duly called for the purpose. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the articles of a closed, corpora closed corporation may contain a classification of shares or rights, the qualification for owning or holding the same, and restrictions on their transfers. No? Under Section 97, restrictions on the right to transfer shares must appear in the articles, the bylaws, and certificate of stock. Ha, tatlo, all of them. Okay? All of them in order to be binding upon any purchaser in good faith. And when we talk about transfer, the law does not limit this to transfers for uh, value. No, It can contemplate donations. Uh, that includes donations in the word transfer. The law allows for restrictions on transfer as a recognition that close corporations are formed by persons who know each other very well. Even usually, they are formed by families. As such, management is usually vested in the same people who are the stockholders. No? They participate in policy decisions which are usually informal and they do not follow the processes or bureaucracy of normal stock corporations. And because they know each other very well, the stockholders of a closed corporations are usually wary about any stranger coming into the business probably because of lack of trust or confidence or to protect themselves from competitors or they're scared of possible friction and disagreements etc no so therefore they will want to choose 
of persons who will join the corporation. So because of these reasons, the law allows restrictions on the transfer of shares in a closed corporation to allow the stockholders to protect themselves from future conflicts. Now, the maximum restriction under the law is the right of first refusal, meaning the right granting an option to the existing stockholders or the corporation to purchase the shares of the transferring stockholder with such reasonable terms, conditions, or period stated. Now, if the period expires without the existing stockholder or the corporation having exercised the option to purchase, meaning within the period the stockholder or the corporation did not buy those shares, okay, then the stockholder who wants to transfer his shares may do so to any third person. Okay? Now, remember, the restrictions must appear in three things, no? the articles, bylaws, and the certificate of stock. Okay? Now, let's say there's a restriction. For example, the right of first refusal can be exercised at a price not exceeding 25% of the par value of such shares. Okay? But this only appears on the bylaws, let's say, no? but not in the articles or in the certificate of stock. Now, if those shares are sold to a third person in good faith, the transferor and the transferee are not bound by the provision because, again, the restriction to be binding must appear in the articles, the bylaws, and the certificate of stock. Okay? Now, what if those restrictions in the articles, bylaws, and certificate of stock are breached? Section 98 gives us the effects, and the first three give us conclusive presumptions okay meaning proof cannot be admitted to counter them no the, these are conclusive presumptions first if a stock of a closed corporation is issued or transferred to any person who is not eligible to be a holder thereof under any provision in the articles and if the stock certificate conspicuously kitang kita shows the qualifications of the persons who are entitled to be the holders of record then that person is conclusively presumed to have notice of the fact of his ineligibility. In other words, kita mo na sa stock. Hindi ka pwede maging stockholder. So you are uh, conclusively presumed to know that you are not eligible. Okay? Second, conclusive presumption. If the articles of a closed corporation states the number of persons not exceeding 20 who are entitled to be stockholders of record and if the stock certificate conspicuously states such number and the issuance or transfer of the stock to any person would cause the stock to be held by more than such number, let's say making it 21, okay? then the person to whom such stock is issued or transferred is conclusively presumed to have notice of this fact. Because again, the articles say that this is only the number that we can have or uh, uh, the maximum under the law is only 20 okay and if the stock certificate of stock says that uh, there are already 20 people this person who receives the stock will be conclusively presumed to know that he is now violating that by being the 21st person okay third if a stock certificate of a closed corporation conspicuously shows a restriction on transfer of the corporation stock and the transferee acquires the stock in violation of such restriction, the transferee is conclusively presumed to have notice of the fact that the stock was acquired in violation of the restriction. Again, simply put, kitang kita mo na sa certificate that there is a restriction and then you acquired it in violation of the restriction you are charged with knowledge of that okay in these three cases the transferee is conclusively presumed to have notice of the restriction or the condition and therefore he is not allowed to prove lack of notice even if such is the fact which brings us to the fourth effect that the corporation cannot be compelled to transfer the stock into the name of the transferee. Specifically, the law says, whenever a person to whom stock of a closed corporation has been issued or transferred has or is conclusively presumed to have notice of 
his ineligibility to be a stockholder, that the transfer of stock would cause the stock of the corporation to be held by more than the number of persons permitted under the articles or the law, or that the transfer violates a restriction on transfer of stock, then what can the corporation do? The corporation may at its option, no? Kung trip niya. The corporation may refuse to register the transfer in the name of the transferee. Okay? The transferee cannot compel the corporation because it's up to the corporation to register or to not register the transfer. Now, the fifth item on the list in section 98 gives us the exception to that, no? The provisions of uh, the previous section will not be applicable if the transfer of stock, even though contrary to uh, the first three sections, has been consented to by all the stockholders of the closed corporation or if the closed corporation has amended its articles. So there are two exceptions to the rule that the corporation cannot be compelled to register the transfer even if there has been violation of the restrictions or conditions. Namely, first, if the transfer of stock has been consented to by all of the stockholders or if the closed corporation has amended its articles. So in these cases, the transfer will now be binding on the closed corporation and the stockholders. Take note that any breach of any that the breach of any condition the breach of any restriction or condition in the issuance or transfer of stock is without prejudice to the right of the transferee under existing laws to rescind the, or cancel the transaction or to recover under any applicable warranty. Okay? That's uh, under uh, item 7 of section 98, okay? So, uh, the transferee can still ask for rescission or cancellation of the transaction or if uh, he has the right, he can uh, ask for uh, uh, his claim under the applicable warranty, if there is any. Now, uh, let's go to agreements by stockholders under section 99, okay? This uh, section, no, it considers as valid between, between the parties the agreements mentioned in that, art in that section when it is executed by the stockholders of a closed corporation. Okay, first, first kind of agreement. Agreements which are duly signed and executed by and among all of the stockholders before the formation and organization of a closed corporation, no? Those agreements will survive the incorporation and they shall continue to be valid and binding between such stockholders if that is their intention to the extent that such agreements are consistent with the articles irrespective of uh, where the provisions of such agreements are contained in the articles or not. No? Now, if the stockholder entered into an agreement before the corporation was formed, that agreement will continue to be valid and binding if they intended it to be valid and binding after the corporation comes into existence as long as they are consistent with the articles okay as for agreements that must be stated in the articles then the stockholders of course they should place those uh, provisions in the articles huh? second agreement a written agreement signed by two or more stockholders may provide that in exercising any voting right, the shares held by them shall be voted as provided or as agreed or in accordance with the procedure agreed upon by them. In other words, the stockholders may agree on the manner or system of voting. Third, no provision in a written agreement signed by, by the stockholders relating to any phase of the corporate affairs shall be invalidated between the parties on the ground that its effect is to make them partners among themselves. Fourth, a written agreement among some or all of the stockholders in a closed corporation shall not be invalidated on the ground that it relates to the conduct of the business and affairs of the corporation as to restrict or interfere with the discretion or powers of the board. 
provided that such agreement shall impose on the stockholders who are parties thereto the liabilities for management acts imposed on directors by the revised corporation code. And fifth, stockholders actively engaged in the management of or operation of the business and affairs of a closed corporation shall be held to strict fiduciary duties, no meaning a uh, position of trust and confidence, no? To each other, no? They'll be held to strict fiduciary duties to each other and among themselves. The stockholders shall be personally liable for corporate torts, okay, or quasi-delicts, unless the corporation has obtained a reasonably adequate liability insurance. Now, in closed corporations, the stockholders may be given preemptive rights. I discussed the stockholders' preemptive right in the episode on powers of uh, corporations. But to review, the right of preemption is the preferential right of a stockholder to subscribe to all issues or disposition of shares of any class in proportion to their present shareholdings. Whenever the capital stock of the corporation is increased and new shares of stock are issued, the new issue must be offered first to the stockholder, okay, to the stockholders who are such at the time the increase was made, in proportion to their existing shareholdings. The purpose of this, no, or the right of preemption, no, is to enable the stockholders to retain proportionate control in the corporation and retain his equity in the surplus. So this refers to rights like voting control, dividend payments, net assets, etc. If the preemptive right is not observed, then the stockholder with such right may lose control when the stocks are offered to other stockholders without preemptive rights who may buy more stock and thus have more control over the corporation over the stockholder with the preemptive right. Okay? So it tries to maintain the status quo. So for closed corporations, the law just says that the preemptive right of stockholders in closed corporations shall extend to all stock to be issued. This includes reissuance of treasury shares, whether for money, property, or personal services, or in payment of corporate debts, unless the articles provide otherwise. In other words, the right of preemption is a matter of absolute right on the part of the stockholder except only when limited by the articles. The purpose is to keep the association intact okay, and to prevent the shifting of control from one faction to another or to unwelcome outsiders and to avoid deadlocks in the management of the corporation. Speaking of deadlocks, the law also provides for rules in this situation. Section 103 says that notwithstanding any contrary provision in the closed corporation's articles, bylaws, or any stockholder's agreement, if the directors or stockholders are so divided on the management of the corporation's business and affairs that the votes required for a corporate action cannot be reached, with the consequence that the business and affairs can no longer be conducted to the advantage of the stockholders generally, then the SEC, upon written petition by any stockholder, shall have the power to arbitrate the dispute. In other words, if there is a deadlock, the remedy of the stockholder is to file a written petition to ask the SEC to arbitrate the deadlock. Arbitration is simply a voluntary dispute resolution process in which one or more arbitrators appointed in accordance with the agreement of the parties or by pertinent rules, those arbitrators will resolve a dispute by rendering an award which will be binding on the parties. In the exercise of the power of arbitration, the SEC has the power to make appropriate orders. Okay, I'll give you some of the orders. No, they can, the SEC can cancel or, or alter any provision contained in the articles, bylaws, or any stockholders agreement. The SEC can also cancel, alter, or enjoin or stop a resolution or act of the corporation or its board, its stockholders, officers, no? 
uh, the SEC may also direct or prohibit any act of the corporation or its board, no, or its officers, stockholders, etc., or any other person party to the action. The SEC may also require the purchase at their fair value of shares of any stockholder, either by the corporation, regardless of the availability of unrestricted retained earnings, or by the other stockholders. The SEC may also appoint a provisional director. And who is a provisional director? He is simply an impartial person who is neither a stockholder nor a creditor of the corporation or any of its subsidiaries or affiliates. The further qualifications may be provided for by the SEC or determined by the SEC, but take note that a provisional director is not a receiver and he does not have the title and powers of a, of a custodian or a receiver. Rather, a provisional director has all the rights and powers of a duly elected director, including the right to be notified of and to vote at all meetings of directors until he is removed by order of the SEC or by all the stockholders. And the compensation of the provisional director shall be determined by agreement between such provisional director and the corporation. Now, the SEC may also issue an order dissolving the corporation no? in case of a uh, its exercise of the power of arbitration in case of deadlock. Huh? It may dissolve the corporation. No? The SEC may order dissolution if it will be beneficial to the stockholders and the creditors. But if instead, if, if the business is successful, then instead of dissolving the corporation, the SEC may uh, appoint a provisional director, no? which uh, is a better uh, alternative, no? especially since the business is successful. And finally, the SEC may also issue any other relief, may, may issue an order granting any other relief as the circumstances may warrant. Just take note again that the power given to the SEC to arbitrate the deadlock may be exercised even if there is a provision in the articles, the bylaws, or the agreements of the stockholders to the contrary. The parties cannot, by agreement, contract away a provision of law. Okay? Because uh, if you remember your obligon, no? uh, the law is uh, deemed impliedly written into every contract. Okay? And a contract will be void if it's contrary to law, uh, morals, public policy, uh, public order, and good customs. Okay? The final topic for discussion uh, will be on withdrawal of a stockholder or uh, dissolution of the closed corporation. On withdrawal of a stockholder, Section 104 says that any stockholder of a closed corporation may, for any reason, compel the corporation to purchase shares held at fair value, which shall not be less than the par or issued value when the corporation has sufficient assets in its books to cover its debts and liabilities exclusive of its capital stock. Okay? This right of the stockholder to withdraw may be exercised for any reason as long as the corporation has sufficient assets to cover its liabilities exclusive of capital stock. For dissolution under the same section 104, any stockholder of a closed corporation may, by written petition to the SEC, compel the dissolution of such corporation in two cases. First, whenever any act of the directors, officers, or those in control of the corporation are illegal, fraudulent, dishonest, oppressive, or unfairly prejudicial to the corporation or any stockholder, or whenever corporate assets are being misapplied or wasted. Now, if the SEC finds merit in the petition, it can now order dissolution after proper notice and hearing. Now, these remedies of withdrawal or uh, compelling dissolution are only in addition to and without prejudice to the other rights and remedies available under the Revised Corporation Code. Okay? So that's it for my discussion on closed corporations. I hope you may have picked up a thing or two and I hope to see you next time guys. See you soon. Bye.